Okay, welcome. Welcome to the first day of Peace Week and to this event uh, entitled The Proud Boys Raging Righ Righteously at the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Um, I'm Daniel Rothbart, I'm joined by my colleague on this project, David Stebbins. And um, just a word about Peace Week. The theme this year is Rethinking Peace 2022 and Beyond. And as you see, I recommend that you go through all of the events and attend as many as possible. You'll see that they're dealing with the most current and pressing issues um, of the day globally um, in conflict analysis and resolution. And they're um, basically engaged in deep analysis as well as implications for peace building efforts itself. Um, again, uh, I'm Daniel Rothbard. I am professor of conflict analysis and resolution at the Carter School. Um, uh, my areas of specialization include ethnic conflict, include civilians at war. Um, also, I've written on the, the ethics of conflict and conflict resolution. And I am currently the director of a laboratory for peace called Transforming the Mind for Peace. Uh, the manager of that lab is Tony Farris, who is with us today. And um, I'd just like to ask my, my partner on this project, uh, David Stebbins, to introduce himself. Sure, thanks, Dan. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Wonderful. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dave Stebbins. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the Carter School. Uh, I'm also a senior policy analyst at the RAND Corporation, where I've worked across uh, various projects uh, related to right-wing extremism. Uh, and I'll suppose you, I'll give you the, the short story on my dissertation work today, but uh, I'm currently working to develop a narrative assessment tool for Department of Defense wargaming. Uh, with the hope of creating a, a reflexive framework to enable learning uh, and examine structural bias within the DOD uh, and across the service components. So yeah, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to, to our chat. Okay, um, thanks Dave. It's great working with you as I've said to you many times. Uh, obviously this was uh, a, a collaborative effort. I think we worked equally on, uh, on this project. Um, so I am going to share my screen and uh, so we can start. Um, so, so here's a plan of what we're gonna do in this, for this session. Um, uh, we'll start with um, kind of a discussion, kind of background issues, uh, the, um, importance of righteous rage in the context of uh, political extremist groups. Then we're gonna go through this particular case study and the methodology, the lit review, the data collection. Um, we use thematic coding for analysis and our, our results, uh, the theme, stories, and motivation. And we also will address some of the challenges that we faced with this study and um, some of the caveats and, and limitations, what we, what we did and what we did not do. Um, again, our focus is on the Proud Boys before, during, and after January 6th. And uh, we, we did find a rich reservoir of data, um, mostly from social media sites, as, as Dave will uh, present in 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 this session, have concluding uh, some conclusions. What what are our take home themes? What does this show for other possible research projects? And we also hope that we engage you engage in addressing some discussion questions that, frankly, we have not completely answered. Or or you know we're we're hoping to get your assistance on how to address some immediate and relevant um, questions that come from this project. So, okay, so what's the context here? Well, 
obviously the the context is the rise, the intensity, and the power of right wing extremist groups or what are called hate groups. And these right wing extremist groups are are quite prominent, obviously throughout the country. The Southern Poverty Law um, Council basically uh, has identified 78 hate groups operating currently in the United States. And they define a hate group as a group that has beliefs or practices that attack or malign an entire class of people. Usually that attack includes character assassination, um, some essentializing immutable negative characteristics. Um, of course, there's many such groups and um, they're typically the target of uh, groups include obviously African Americans, uh, Jews, immigrants, especially immigrants from south of the border. Um, and this is obviously in intensely, the attack on immigrants is intensely racialized. Uh, and it basically reflects an aspiration for the, uh, a kind of racial purity an aspiration for religious purity. Obviously, white Christians um, are basically represent the ethnic and religious model for many of these extremist groups, the model as, as defining what, what it means to be an American. And interestingly, there's a very long history of right-wing extremist groups in the United States. Many of these groups, in fact, studies have shown that most of these um, hate groups have originated in America's rural heartland, that is, in the areas um, away from uh, urban centers. Of course, they've expanded uh, over the years to include members within urban areas, but there is a very strong historical tendency of rural radicalism. And this radicalism is often associated with the kind of vigilantism. And this vigilantism basically um, is, is, draws upon the idea that these groups take it upon themselves to quote, purify the American scene, what it means to be American. One very striking trend in this kind of um, um, this kind of militancy is the politics of white rage, which traffics in the fear that the nation's pure people, white Christians, are threatened. And again, may I repeat that this, the politics of white rage uh, did not begin in 2016. Um, it has had a long and deep history in the American culture. So one of these groups is the Oath Keepers, as you may know, who were who are very prominent uh, after the um, 20, uh, um, after, very prominent after the election of President Trump. The Oath Keepers basically draw upon this narrative that the American federal government is preparing to institute, as it were, kind of concentration camps of, of radicals and, um, and as it were alleged um, patriots according to their, to their followers. And one of the inspirations for some of, this, some of these groups is the writings of Timothy McVeigh, who as you know, was responsible for the bombing in Oklahoma City and he basically took on, in his writings, a self-righteous stance as um, basically demanding or insisting that the government is fundamentally corrupting the American landscape with its policies. And he is morally and strategically, this bombing is equivalent to the US hitting a government building in Serbia. So his writings did influence certain extremist groups uh, uh, that followed. So just a, a few words about righteous rage. The 
assumption of our work is that rage has become a dominant instrument of power among extremist groups. This sense of righteousness, this sense of, of moral imperative to be aggressive, to exhibit this intense emotion against adversaries has, has become very common in the American political landscape. Again, it's not new, but I think it is exhibited by many of the right-wing extremist groups. And we also think that righteous rage is exhibited in some cases, in some contexts, by left-wing so-called social justice groups as well. So rage is um, appealing psychologically. Uh, there have been a number of studies of uh, the psychology of rage and um, psychologists would define rage as an intense form of anger that is exhibited in various behavioral ways, oftentimes as a predictor of aggression. Um, but rage, there's an allure, a psychological, um, almost um, appeal to rage. Rage is exciting in some cases, that is the public performance of rage. It's individual feelings are entangled with a political struggle. Rage is both personal and political, which seems like a contradiction, but in the experience of rage, it is clearly personal, it's my rage, as if nobody can question the authenticity of my rage. That's the kind of underlying uh, stance that someone says. And yet it is political in the sense that it can basically it's, um, influence, it's intended to influence uh, viewers, witnesses. This is quite obvious in cases where political leaders, uh, extremist leaders, or leaders of nations exhibit intense rage as a form of galvanizing public support. It's a kind of um, combination of emotional capital, that is the capacity to exhibit this emotion with political capital. So, Rage, as I say, we think is really quite prominent among um, extremist groups. It clearly intersects with many other negative emotions, hate, revenge, anger, um, bitterness, uh, some cases dehumanization. Our focus here is on one emotion. Obviously, we um, are delving deeply into that. And we basically, uh, suggests that rage is a unifying force that shapes intra-group relations and intergroup identity and difference. So it is a unifying force that shapes the intergroup relations. That is, it draws upon potential recruits. It intensifies their commitment, their resolve, and their preparedness for sacrifice. That's the intra-group um, identity, and it clearly establishes and solidifies intergroup difference with respect to the intensity against uh, their adversary. So just um, a few words about rage. There is, of course, a neurological dimension to rage. It often uh, is associated with activation of the amygdala, a portion of the brain that's associated with intense emotion. And yet it's important in terms of understanding the psychology of rage, it's important to note that this emotion is not cut off from cognition. It is not come off, cut off from a, an understanding, an interpretation, a cognitive um, encapsulation of the world, of events, of course, from, the, from one perspective that um, with rage, it's both mind, body, and cognition that are co-constitutive. So um, what exactly is rage uh, as power? It Basically, rage can have or has 
in this context three dimensions, three defining elements. First, manifestation of rage, that is the behavior. And we have seen rage in public performances of polit many political leaders, that is uh, the intense fury in public spaces, which is directed at adversaries. It often intensifies, it, it, it co comes with the symbolic narratives of the enemy evil, the enemy danger, the threats, different forms of threats, and of course the in-group victimization and innocence and purity. The second dimension of rage is power is that it's its contagion effect. Rage is contagious. Psychologists have demonstrated how observers of someone's rage can actually catch the same emotion. What catch means is that they'll mimic the behavior like yelling or screaming or um, uh, intensifying the, the expression. And then in turn, the observer takes on that rage as if mimicking the behavior of the of what of the, of the person uh, conveying it. And a third dimension of rage is that it is defines intra-group relations and intergroup relations. That is, it is a defining operational principle of many extremist groups. It is not minor, it is not momentary, it is not limited to one or two, a few people. It is absolutely defining, um, where many times the particular issue comes and goes, the membership may come and go, but the rage as an operating principle, we believe is um, continues. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague on this um, to continue the discussion about the Proud Boys. I stopped. Okay, thanks, Dan. Let me just. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let's see how well uh, our transition goes here. Uh, okay. Can everybody see uh, the the slides? Okay, and can hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do my best to keep video on today, so that you know uh, that I'm a real person. But I do have uh, various bandwidth issues uh, where I am today. Um, but yeah, so uh, Dan, thank you again for the setup. Uh, I mean, that was that was uh, a wonderful um, way to provide context in our research. So um, today, Dr. Rothbart asked me to speak a bit um, about a couple of different things. Um, so what I'd like to do is provide a bit of backdrop for the, the work we've been conducting over the past year or so. Um, and so uh, a couple of key points here on this slide to, to set this up. Um, so first, uh, I think we're probably all aware of this, right? But just in case, um, there was an attack on the U.S. Capitol uh, on January 6th that sought to um, disrupt the, the validation of the 2020 electoral vote. Um, there were several groups and, and uh, individuals uh, involved in the attack, and actually much of the area around the Capitol, uh, if you're in the area, uh, still remains on lockdown. The second point here is that although um, group values and belief systems existed prior to the attack, uh, there were probably some key narrative elements at play that day that motivated groups to, to storm the Capitol. Uh, and really since the attack, there have been, um, I think, three lines of efforts to address the groups that were responsible in planning and carrying out the attack. Um, so the first has been um, directly prosecuting individuals um, that were responsible. Uh, the second has been trying to figure out what to call these groups, right? So whether that's uh, whether they're domestic terrorists or right-wing extremists or or something else entirely. Uh, and then third, um, there are still ongoing investigations into various group networks, um, trying to figure out who may have planned or or directed the attack. Um, however, what we really haven't seen much, uh, you know, in the way of trying to understand uh, what makes these groups tick, right? So that is. The, the motivations beyond the usual framing of these groups as extremists or, or white supremacists. So we thought this might be a, a, a great uh, exploratory research question. Um, you know, that is, can we make sense of these intergroup meeting making processes to, to understand their, their motivations? Uh, again, in an effort to explore what options might exist, right, for future engagement or, or mediation efforts. 
Okay, so here is, um, we're on slide 13, um, and we can make these available after the brief as well. We, we have it in PDF and, and happy to send this out. Um, but this is a quick snapshot of our research approach, uh, and I won't read uh, each of these points to you, uh, but the key points here are that we really wanted to focus on the literature uh, most relevant to our research. Um, and you heard Dan speak about some of that uh, already a couple of slides ago. Uh, but so this provided the context for some of our thematic coding that appears later in the article. Uh, and we'll also show some of those excerpts and themes that we extracted uh, in a moment. For, for data collection, um, this really varied based on how much information we could find uh, on a single source. Uh, and we'll also note a couple of other challenges we had uh, with that on the next slide. Uh, but you can see here um, that, that one of the main challenges was actually uh, accessing the, the actual data since many of these sites used by group members have, have been cut off um, since the attack by law enforcement. So the, the data came from a few different places, um, posted, news art, uh, posted news articles, uh, social media sites, uh, and then we were able to find some screenshots of Proud Boys um, Telegram channels uh, and WhatsApp channels that former members have posted uh, since leaving the group. Uh, and then finally, we used the, um, the established literature to put forth some possible framing for consideration, uh, namely that of, of righteous rage. So here are uh, some of the primary challenges we faced with this research. Again, one of the, the major issues for us, and I just alluded to this on the, on the previous slide, was that many of the social media sites or platforms used by these groups um, have been shut down in the wake of the Capitol attack. So this would likely also be an issue uh, for any research conducted on other groups present at the attack um, who might tend to, or, or who might prefer to communicate via encrypted um, applications or, or platforms. So this really inhibits our ability, right, to collect timely and relevant group data on a continual basis. Um, I would also say that it was a little tough because sometimes it was unclear whether um, particular comments were positioned as a reaction to a specific event or, or who constituted the, the intended audience. So the other problem was trying to uh, find information that wasn't already pre-categorized or, or framed through an extremist lens, right? We wanted to remain as objective as possible in our research. And what I mean by that is, you know, trying to find um, primary source data uh, without subsequent interpretation, right? Which of course is interesting from a narrative perspective, uh, and seeing how these sorts of categorizations are continually uh, structured or reinforced through, through various depictions of these groups. So we had to try and sift through a lot of that, uh, trying to get what we were looking for. Um, for example, we were able to extract some primary source information from the um, Southern Poverty Law Center uh, and the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, but again, these were sort of in pre, uh, predetermined or, or pre-categorized bins that we had to weed out. And the same went for, for newspapers and other media coverage, right? So who typically try to create some sort of headline grabbing title that positions us uh, as readers before we've even read the actual content. So um, just some, some unique data challenges uh, to share with you there. Okay, so uh, probably no surprise here, but our uh, case study looked at the Proud Boys, and I, I did paste um, the, the URL for that article and the actual PDF in the chat. If you don't see it there, um, we're hearing it may have or it, it may disappear at various times, so we, we can repost that at the end of our, our chat today so you've got it. Um, but this group was formed um, just, just a few months, actually, before Trump took office in 2016 uh, by Gavin McGinnis. Um, who has a, uh, an interesting and storied history himself uh, with his own study, um, but he actually is one of the co-creators of Vice News, if you've heard of that, um, back in 1994. Uh, and he founded the group based on this idea of Western chauvinism, uh, something the group believes um, is needed to create a better America, or that the world would be uh, better off, right, if we return to a 1940s or 1950s mindset. And one of the interesting things here is that they do not associate themselves with, uh, with you know, right-wing extremists or alt-right uh, white supremacists or other extremists, since they believe uh, that they lead an inclusive group. So really, McInnes wrote the founding Proud Boys Charter in an online magazine article, and you can see uh, it was, this was in Taki's magazine. Um, and I think they held their first meeting uh, of the group in a small bar uh, in New York City. Uh, so again, the, the Proud Boys are founded on this idea of Western chauvinism, 
uh, and have some interesting initiation rights to, to live up to that motto. And again, I, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to read from the slides, um, uh, but all that content is there for you. Um, it, and I, I couldn't uh, be making this up, but apparently one of the steps uh, for initiation includes getting uh, beaten up by other in-group members while you attempt to uh, name five breakfast cereals. Um, and you can see some of the other steps here to receive uh, full membership. Um, for example, uh, one must recite the words that appear in that first bullet point here. Um, I'm a Western chauvinist and I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. Um, it, they also have to receive a tattoo that signifies their, their ideals of patriotism. Uh, and members must also be willing to, to fight for their cause, right, through, through violence uh, if necessary. And so now that we've provided um, a, a little bit of background, uh, and again, this is more, uh, goes into more depth in our article, um, we thought it might be useful to show some of the excerpts from that founding charter in, in Taki Magazine that McKinnis wrote about. And you'll see a, a couple of different things on this slide, and I'm hoping it's big enough for everyone. I, I know it's, it's kind of a word wall here, but um, first you're gonna see on, on the left-hand side, the actual quote uh, or excerpt that we, that we uncovered. Uh, the second column has our codes that were applied based on our findings in the literature. Uh, and then finally, you'll see our overall theme uh, based on the content uh, that we examined. Um, so for example, you can see in that first line um, that the group is firmly uh, establishing their identity as male, um, followed by this idea of Western chauvinism, uh, and then some other various components that depict um, group uh, group boundaries, uh, prototypes, and, and, and group motivations. And I suppose that ultimately the group is invoking this sort of um, mythic tradition or mythic past that they would like to return to. Uh, and of course, a past that must be fought for, right, through, through any means necessary. Um, I'm happy to pause here for a moment just to make sure everyone has, has time to, to scan some of the excerpts here uh, from, from the original charter, or, or happy to, to pause and answer any questions before we move on. So one of the things we originally wanted to, to do was to provide a narrative analysis on some of the images or symbolism evidenced through Proud Boys uniforms in our article. Uh, but I suppose I never realized uh, how short our 8,000 word limit actually was until we started writing. Uh, so unfortunately this does not appear in our article, um, but we at least wanted to provide a glimpse um, of what we were also working on in the background of this study. So what you see here, um, so the first image here is showing the iconic black and yellow shirts commonly associated with Proud Boys uh, group membership. Uh, the first image uh, also highlights a number of group uh, membership mandates, um, including tattoos, again, that depict this uh, notion of U.S. Constitution or patriotism, uh, it, various phrases from that, uh, Proud Boy acronyms, um, and other symbols associated with, with notions of, of patriotism. The second image here, uh, again, top right, um, is depicting several group members marching to protest U.S. election results uh, in December 2020. Um, I think they're in D.C. in this photo. Uh, again, about one month before the attack on January 6th. The third image uh, shows Gavin McGinnis. Again, this is the co-founder uh, of the group. Uh, under the protection of uh, two Proud Boys group members, uh, you'll see that both members are wearing the uh, Make America Great Again, or the MAGA hats, right, that were made famous during the 2016 presidential uh, campaign. Uh, and it's tough to see here. I think uh, it got a little bit cut off, but there's also the numbers nine and three that appear on these black sweatshirts um, in, on the individual in front of the image. Um, it's, w w the, uh, the SDLC says that number nine may refer to one set of beliefs um, that suggests that only 9% of the pop world population is white and that only 3% of children are, are white uh, globally. And then the fourth image uh, at the bottom right is just showing sort of an amalgamation of symbols that have been appropriated from other groups um, over the past 100 years, actually. There, there's, uh, again, you could do a study on each of the images used here. Um, and I've tried to make these images as large as I could for the presentation. Um, but you know, again, I'm happy to send these slides after our chat today. So here is um, another set of excerpts that we wanted to provide today that also uh, appears in our article. Uh, and this is one of those examples where our data came from, uh, again, a couple of different online sources posted at different times. 
Um, but the main point here is to show the evolution of group solidarity or group stability in the months and years uh, after their founding in 2016. So again, you can see the verbatim text provided in the left-hand column. Uh, and again, sorry, I know it's a little bit small, uh, but again, that's followed by our codes on the right-hand side. Um, and then of course, the overall theme from these statements um, that we suggest as, um, or, or suggesting that group members believe that the very existence of the white race uh, is engaged in this epic fight for survival, right, against various outgroups. Now, of course, the, these comments may appear a bit, um, well, they, they seem like they're all over the map, right? But we, we can see complaints about, you know, India and Australia, apparently about European whites coming in to save folks, um, sort of along the lines that, you know, colonialism should be seen as a good thing. Uh, then we have various comments about uh, Iraq. And uh, again, I'm not, I'm trying not to read the slides to you, but you know, then we have these comments about a commonly held fear that only about, uh, again, 3% of the global population of children are white, right? So uh, this is one of those common narratives that circulates within the group. Um, and then you can see at the bottom where some of the group's rhetoric starts to turn towards more of a, um, more towards a call for violence to achieve group goals or objectives, again, and sort of the events leading up to the attack. Um, and again, I'm, I'm happy to pause here for a moment um, if, if folks need some more time uh, reading. Uh, or again, if there's any questions, happy to pause for a moment. So what I've tried to do uh, so far is to provide a little bit of context for you about the formation of the group, um, some of its founding principles, and a little bit of the, uh, the trajectory of the group um, as evidenced through the excerpts that we've highlighted uh, here and of course that uh, appear in our article. What I'd like to do now is to move ahead to the actual attack on the Capitol um, before talking briefly about some of the events that have occurred uh, since the attack happened. So I'm not sure if folks on the call today have um, access to the Washington Post, um, but there's a highly detailed, uh, a really good chronology of January 6 events uh, that I would highly recommend to check out after this discussion today if you've not already seen it. And, that, and again, I can post that link in uh, at the end of our, of our chat today. So the, the story uh, of that day actually starts a little bit earlier than the actual events that transpired. Uh, and I don't think we have time to go into all of it today, um, but, but very briefly, so Trump's series of tweets about the election results started around 8 a.m. that morning uh, after seeing the results of a, a very close Senate race in Georgia, where, uh, and this had been going on since Biden was elected in November, um, but he and his supporters continued to suggest that the US presidential elections uh, were not valid. Uh, and as this was happening, um, several prominent groups started to show up on the grounds near the Capitol. Uh, January 6th was the day that Congress was due to, to certify the, the election results. Um, so finally, around noon, Trump shows up to the grounds to provide a rallying speech to his supporters. Um, and this wasn't just a uh, supporter, this wasn't just the Proud Boys, right? So this also included several other groups, uh, including the, the Patriot Front, uh, the Three Percenters, the, the Oath Keepers that Dan mentioned before, uh, and many others. And I think it's taken over a year, and of course, investigations are still going on, right? But about a year to fully understand the amount of planning and coordination it took to, to orchestrate actions among all of the groups present that day. Um, and this information is still coming out in the form of hearings, court filings, and other group members who have since disbanded uh, uh, post-attack. This is also where Enrique Terrio, uh, who again could probably use his own case study uh, as an in-group prototype, um, but where Terrio and other group members uh, of the Proud Boys um, started planning for that day and how it allowed so many individuals to, to breach the, the Capitol walls. And let me just flip to the next slide for, for a moment. So you can see this uh, in pictures as you move from the left hand of the slide to the right hand side. But you can see that um, you know, all of this is kind of going on uh, outside. Um, those meant to certify the election began to, to hunker down uh, in the Senate chambers. Um, and as time goes on, just around 2 p.m., group members begin to, um, to climb the Capitol walls and enter the building. Uh, and I'm setting the, the, the actual police and military response to the side for now, but it, you know, it took until about 8 p.m. to actually certify the, the election results. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, again, even though this happened about a year and a half ago, uh, I'm still not sure that we as the public uh, or even researchers, right, still know the full extent uh, of what actually happened that day. So 
So obviously there are still um, daily hearings uh, on the Hill about this. Um, I don't think I've read a newspaper in the past 18 months without this event serving uh, as a prominent role uh, in the headlines. So um, again, I just wanted to pr provide this visual uh, as a quick refresher. So the, the next part of our article um, fast forwards a bit in time, um, again, due to, to length requirements, but we wanted to highlight the evolution of the group post capital attack, um, again, to see if we could trace elements of righteous rage through the group's uh, current status. So we note here that, um, in fact, many Proud Boys group members actually withdrew support for Trump after the attack, um, mainly due to the thought that the former president had uh, surrendered to Biden. Um, and what we have now is a group that really appears to be divided into three main subgroups. So we have um, those who have accepted the results of the 2020 election, uh, those who have not, right? And then we're seeing other members uh, who are seeking an entirely different uh, U.S. political system. We also begin to see around this time that many of those excerpts we showed you before, the ones aimed at fostering group uh, solidarity or stability, uh, began to be a bit more scattered. So while much of the rhetoric uh, is still focused on the election, uh, elements of righteous rage begin to be directed at other um, various targets, right? So uh, vaccination mandates, uh, mask mandates, uh, virtual learning. Um, and, and I'll come back to this in a few slides, but although the messaging was uh, a bit more scattered, uh, it appeared that the Proud Boys violence actually increased across U.S. cities um, after January 6th uh, at each of the various uh, group ch chapter locations. Um, so I, I think that the main headquarters, right, or I'm using air quotes, headquarters is in Oregon, uh, and then they have various chapters in North and South Carolina. <clears throat> so what we did, um, what we thought we would, be, would be interesting is to look at one of the final speeches of the former leader, uh, Enrique Terrio, just before he went to prison uh, to see if or to see whether uh, his final public comments offered any direction uh, for the future of the group, um, or to, um, excuse me. And, and you can see some of the key points here, but would suggest that really his final act before being cut off from communications with the group was to um, reaffirm group values, uh, boundaries, and threats, um, sort of further implotting Proud Boys uh, in this continuous struggle against this set of, of mythic enemies. And again, I'll pause here for a moment to give uh, folks a chance to scan, uh, but I, I suppose I'll briefly just call out some of the language used here. Um, and you can see comments that refer to, uh, you know, they're coming after me, or they want to kill you, or we are more together now than we've ever been. Um, so these sorts of things that attempt to hold on to the group, uh, again, as it starts to fragment into these three subgroups. And again, I'll, I'll pause here for a moment before moving on. Okay. And here, I know these are just um, uh, snapshots in time, but I, I wanted to highlight the difference between the number of group members uh, present on January 6, uh, 2021, uh, versus one year later at a planned um, Proud Boys rally, uh, known as the J6 rally uh, in the same location. Um, so again, I think this is just an important image to showcase group, uh, group membership uh, post attack, again, despite uh, Enrique Terrio's attempts to, to bring the group back together uh, in the aftermath of the attack. And uh, again, I, I mentioned uh, that the uh, Proud Boys violence actually increased uh, in the mid to late, uh, in mid, mid to late 2021 across major US cities. Um, you can see some of those classic black and yellow uh, uniforms and symbols in that first image. Um, I believe this was at an anti-vaccination rally in Oregon. Uh, and then in image two, uh, and it may be difficult to see on your screen, uh, but there are actually children in the back of this Proud Boy member's car. And I think this is important from a, a narrative perspective, right? So that, you know, we might consider the effect of the Proud Boy's narrative from a generational perspective, uh, in that many of those ideals uh, could be passed on to, to future uh, generations, right? So that righteous rage may actually be, uh, have a generational uh, factor. Uh, and then uh, image three in the bottom right, I believe this was a, an image taken in South Carolina after Terrio was in prison. Uh, the interesting thing here is that he's seen as a political prisoner. Um, so obviously another factor that relates into um, perpetuating this, this element of, of righteous rage.
So, so where does this all uh, leave us? Well, uh, you know, first I think our paper is really um, intended to begin this discussion on righteous rage. Obviously we would need um, a great deal of additional research and data that looks at other groups to compare um, and contrast what sorts of other elements might be at play. Uh, and, and I'll turn back to Dan uh, in a moment for some of those uh, points. But I think, you know, what we're hoping that our paper begins to do is to shift thinking among, you know, not only the groups examined, right, but also among um, um, affected groups. Not that we're seeking to sympathize, but rather uh, an attempt to achieve the type of uh, moral imagination Lederach suggests. And this, uh, of course, is easier uh, said than done, but of course, keeping in, in the theme of, of, of Peace Week uh, that we find ourselves in today. And, you know, it was incredibly difficult to remain objective throughout this research process, right? But I think that I would suggest that, um, you know, these groups really do perceive uh, at least some sort of loss or trauma, whether we actually agree with it or not. Um, so really in terms of conflict resolution, um, I think this is really about trying to provide a space or, or opportunity to get those stories out so that we can really see uh, what we're working with, right? Instead of silencing those stories solely through um, law enforcement actions. And I don't think this can be uh, really accomplished in the, a traditional sort of uh, safe space environment, right? Where we have to be careful about what's said or you know, tread lightly or have to navigate around these stories instead of examining them thoroughly. Um, and you can see some of the salty language that the journal actually accepted from these, these excerpts here. But you know, rather striving towards a, a brave engagement space where groups can speak openly about the causes and effects of their perceived realities. Um, so I, I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Dr. Rothbart for some concluding, uh, some concluding comments um, before we move on to our discussion questions. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. And um, Dave really did an excellent summary of, of our data and our methodology and our thematic analysis. And underpinning our analysis is kind of the intersection of three critical processes in, in the existence of this group. It's the process of identity formation, who they are, how they self-define, um, who how they cast their adversaries. And as, as Dave mentioned, the adversaries kept changing as the issues changed. They, uh, and it, it's striking, as, as Dave mentioned, in 2016, they framed themselves as not a racist group. They did not want to be politically aligned with the neo-Nazis or with the Klan. But that changed significantly as the issues changed, as the um, uh, maybe the membership changed, and um, up to recently intense uh, activism against uh, vaccination mandates, as, as you mentioned. So underpinning that is the triplet of identity, power, and rage. This triplet defines who they are. It, it, the sense, I think that we in conflict analysis and social scientists have given um, too much emphasis on the prominence of ideology per se, or at least a narrow vision of ideology as a cognitive vision of social political categories in the world, um, underpinning that ideology is something that stays constant with this particular extremist groups. Again, that is this identity power and rage. And uh, also I should mention, it's not only rage, obviously it's hate, and vilification, in some cases, demonization. The other element that we, we find striking is a kind of emotional cognitive move, move from the individual to the group, that we have shown that there are certain manifestations of collective rage, collective emotion, um, uh, and those kind of go Kind of move from the individual rage to the collective rage. Of course, individual responses to an emotion are, are can be physiological, um, and collective responses are obviously narratives and uh, uh, mechanisms of public pronunciation. But this back and forth, we think, is um, one result. And um, and yet we, as I mentioned, we still faced a, a number of methodological challenges, um, as Dave mentioned. So um, 
So I'm going to um, transition to inviting questions, comments, um, observations, assist. Oh, let me just selfishly, Dave, you wanted to show the first page just to, this is a shameless demonstration of our product here, the first page of our article. You have uh I'm, I'm i'm working on bringing it up dan sorry it's, it's okay. loading all right um so um we're open for questions comments observations suggestions we want to move forward maybe do other projects within this the scope of this um uh um and i recognize your professor lester kurtz who was very kind enough to invite his students or or require, I'm not sure, but nice to see you, Lester. Thank you, uh, Daniel. This is really great. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, really fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to join you today. Um, this is a social problems and solutions class. And this is perfect because we're beginning to discuss violence uh in today's class session so the um the thing that i was really uh intrigued by is how these um these folks are so patriotic and it seems like democracy is such a an inherent part of the american narrative and american patriotism um i'm wondering i'm wondering what they do with that three percent or nine percent if they're only three percent or nine percent of the world's population and it's interesting that they emphasize that um because if, if if they're in favor of democracy then it seems like they should uh well uh, uh what, what did what did the president say stand back stand aside and what stand back and stand aside um i think it was uh what is it stand down and stand by something like that uh, that was it stand down and stand by, stand it's, it's stand like by. If, if they're great if they're great uh champions of democracy um then they would have to, to stand down right uh if they're only three percent and nine percent of the world's population um but i'm wondering how much democracy is part of their narrative i i don't recall seeing that right um, well, obviously, they took on the Trump um, fabrication of the stolen election. So at one level, that one of their narratives is that democracy is, at, is being undermined by the Democrats who they call communists. So their, their frame of their political adversaries, Democrats, liberals, and so on, and Biden, obviously, um, is they would... From, from their perspective is consistent with the ideal of democracy. The fact that they're inconsistent with the point you mentioned, Lester, is no surprise. Um, one of the um, commonalities of, of extremist groups is willful stupidity. And what I mean, I, I'm, I'm serious about the stupidity. I mean, there is a willful disregard of minimal standards of rationality I could go on for a long list of examples, as I think you you could as well, um, that um, basically reinforce, again, we think is the, the power. So, so, so that narrative, I think, is one of many, the power dynamics stay this consistent. Um, I see, I guess I'll happy to recognize people. I see Drav, Parikh. Hi, Professor. Um, yeah, my question is in two parts. Uh, well, there are two questions. Essentially, the first question I wanted to ask was, do you think that the way the insurrection happened, the, the way they challenged the, the rage into an armed insurrection by storming the Capitol, would that have been possible had it not been so easy for them to uh, gain access to weaponry? And the second question is, how, how can you chat uh, channel the level of uh, concentration required to um, maintain your 
unbiased nature while studying the level of hate and vitriol that these groups seem to espouse. The second question is how we can remain unbiased. Is that, I'm sorry, is that? Yeah, 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 how you can remain uh, unbiased. Let me take the, the second question. And Dave, I'd like to invite you to take the first question about weapons. Um, uh, thank you. That second question, both questions are excellent. This is such a great question, Drav. Um, and my answer is we are never unbiased. Okay. We are driven by normative commitments to select a research, uh, in this case, an extremist group, to have certain objectives um, in, the, in our project to um, frame this with an implied moral indictment. We are engaged in moral reflection, at least indirectly. In this article, we didn't explicitly talk about um, the immorality, but it is certainly clear. It's, in my opinion, I think all conflict, mo excuse me, most conflict research is research that's morally inspired, that's, um, ethically driven and with implications for with inseparable implications with practice. That's my opinion. Um, Dave, you want to address that or and, and the other question? Yeah, certainly, you know, research ethics uh, teachers probably, you know, it, 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 in this work. And, you know, I think I alluded to that in one of the challenges, right, is, it, it, you know, can we, can we remain objective uh, throughout, uh, you know, hard to do that again. You know, whenever I, I look at these initiation rights and just think about, um, you know, getting beat up while you name five breakfast cereals, well, that seems uh, incredibly, you know, ridiculous. But again, that's based on my, you know, previous schemas and, and values, morals, beliefs. Uh, the list goes on, right? So um, it, it's, tip, it's difficult to set those sorts of things aside. And I think we've done that successfully, um, uh, you know, in this article. And that's, again, why we sort of let the the, the stories breathe for themselves, right? So we, we, we show you the excerpts, we show um, a framing used through the righteous rage literature. Again, that's part of our method. Um, and again, I think that helps uh, us maintain, uh, you know, a level of um, objectivity rather than, you know, putting our, our, our own spin on, on, on each of these excerpts uh, th throughout the article. Okay, and the access to weapon, could they have, could they have uh, been, a f uh, would they have been active without access to weapons? Dave. Yeah, and so I, I yeah, no, that, that's a wonderful question, and I think what you're asking is, um, so I might have to clarify, because so when the, when the attack happened, right, none of these individuals were actually armed, right, so they didn't have real handguns, they didn't have real automatic weapons, uh, if anything, they had uh, zip ties, right, which are these um, um, plastic handcuffs that, that sometimes police or SWAT teams will use, right, instead of metal handcuffs, so they had plastic hand ties. Um, they may have had um, mace or pepper spray with them. Um, but so there is this sort of bizarre gray area where they, they are allowed to carry those things um, uh, on the Capitol grounds. I don't believe any of them were actually armed. Um, that's not to say that, you know, access to I guess maybe you, this question is sort of coming from a Second Amendment um, uh, uh, stance. Whereas, right, so in Oregon and South Carolina, they very much are parading around with assault rifles and attempting to intimidate, um, you know, the public. And some of the, in some of the photos I, I showed you too, um, they're not actually assaulting people with, with um, real weapons. These are, these are air guns or uh, uh, pepper sprays or, 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 or mace gels. Again, they're, they're trying to, I'm using air quotes again, trying to remain within the bounds of the law, right? So I, I don't think, um, I, and again, I could be wrong, right? But I don't think they actually had actual um, um, real firing weapons uh, on the grounds of the Capitol that day. I think uh, they stormed again with these sort of uh, plastic uh, handcuffs. Um, you know, once they were in the Capitol, they would grab a flagpole or a statue or something, and you know, they would threaten people with with things that were already there. Um, but I don't know if weapons featured promptly um, as, as part of the attack. Okay, if that answers your question. We have a number of uh, questions, so let's go in sequence to Tori. Thank you. Um, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. And my question is regarding white rage. And as you acknowledged, you know, it's just kind of willful ignorance. So I was curious, is there 
an unmet need that they are allocating, you know, the great replacement theory for and just overlooking some sort of other uh, origin for the white rage. Okay. <laughs> I think you're asking one of the hardest questions that in spite of millions of words that have been produced about this, there's still not an adequate understanding, an answer to your question. Um, all I can say very briefly is that there is both a very strong historical legacy of this kind of rage in certain population groups across the country. As I say, you know, they oftentimes began in rural, uh, in, in the rural, quote, heartland. And secondly, there is the obviously catalyst of the current political leadership, excuse me, past political leadership, presidential leadership. Um, and there was, there was a, uh, it's kind of a culture, I, I just want to go back to the cultural historical legacy for this, which I think is under-examined. It is clearly a legacy that intersects with racism um, and, and ethnic stereotyping, but I think that that should, that needs to be examined in great detail. There obviously is enormous studies on the history of racism. I think there still needs to be more attention to American right-wing extremism um, and that kind of cultural historical legacy. That's the best I can do right now, but your, your question needs to be examined in great detail. Dave, do you want to address that question? No, I, I think it's a wonderful question, and I, I think she read read our minds on one of our, our upcoming uh, discussion question slides. But yeah, I mean, it, it's a wonderful question. You know, e even thinking about Burton's sort of you know basic needs, and you know w which of those you know five or six do they perceive as unmet? I I, I think these are wonderful questions. Um, I I do not, I do not have a, a real time answer for you, but um, certainly worth exploring uh, in our future study, which we hope to do. Right, there is an allure of victimization, a victimization competition, which we see in many conflict dynamics that is a very powerful psychological um, appeal for many people. But, okay, moving on to Heather. Uh, yes, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, my speaker can be fussy at times. Um, so I actually, um, have sort of a twofold question. And the first part of it goes back to something I was noticing on some of the transcripts that you included and the coding that was being done on them. Uh, so one thing I didn't see coded, but I thought was interesting was a reference to high school. Uh, I think it was uh, the, the actual transcript said, um, quoting something about starting in high school. And knowing the sort of the psychology and you know cognitive formations and everything that happen in high school, and to what degree those can be highly influential in a lot of this, and especially in actually relation to Tori's question, um, to what degree you noticed that or were potentially sort of following up on that. I think it was one of the earlier. Right. Yeah, Dave, you want to, that, that has to do with uh, gender relations. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dave, do you want to uh, address that? Sure. Um, is, just to make sure I'm following the right, is, is this the, um, the the slide you may you may have seen that? Is this, I'm not the unapologetic guy um, that I should have been? Uh, it's starting, starting in high, high school. school. Yeah, yeah. Sure, and so um, and so the question here is. Um, I, I guess the question I, is to what degree you have sort of noticed or followed on that thread, and how. Oh, sure. Is sort of an origination originating point of that those developmental years in terms of this sense of rage, including tied in with things like identity and uh, victimization and to what degree you have followed up on that. And I guess that that comes back to 
the other half of this question, which is sort of that distinction between the individual and the group and whether we need to be looking at much more upstream solutions and, and conceptualization around this. Yeah, yeah uh, I, go, go ahead, Dan, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, no, I, I think there, there's definitely an intersection be between the, the points you mentioned. Again, we, we were, um, you know, sort of uh, framing or categorizing based on righteous rage. Obviously, there are many other uh, undercurrents here that intersect, uh, for example, gender, uh, ethnicity, identity, and, and, and so forth. Uh, but no, I think an excellent point. Um, Dan, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, this is an example of the politicization of um, the, the political vilification of the women's movement. This, this is a, a kind of um, intersection of individual sense of failure with women, however they define failure, obviously, and the, the women's movement. And so this is a kind of victimization, which they then convert to um, a collective power, that they are victims of this movement. They are, you know, they're not gonna be apologetic and subservient is the, is the, is the stance here. Um, so I, I think that's a theme that began, the groups began as, as Dave is showing here in this thing, this is the founding charter which emphasized the return to Western children, you know, men are men and women are women and, and so on by, by, their, by their frame. Um, okay, uh, Sophia, great. Um, hi, sir. So I guess my question is when it comes to righteous, do you think the righteousness or the rage comes first? And just to like what I mean by that is um normally was like acting like rationally. They would start with like, you know, I guess in this case, like these people believe that, you know, white people are under attack or like, you know, all these different things about like the 9% and the 3% and like all these things creates a feeling of righteousness that they're they have like a just cause and that would lead to them like feeling rage and angry about the situation I guess something I kind of wonder is like at least for like some of these people how much of it is like they feel a sense of rage already about you know like minority or women or like gay people or you know whatever and then they try and find justifications for that rage so mm -hmm. I just kind of wanted to hear your perspective on that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm drawing upon what psychologists have shown very recent important discoveries about what is an emotion. And so many of our emotions are inseparable from our understanding of the world. What is grief? Grief is suffering from the loss of a close relative. Um, what is fear? Fear is an emotional basically response to a perception of uh, a threat. And so with rage, psychologists basically have, have shown that there is not a hard and fast division between the thought of, let's say, you know, an, an enemy group and the feeling that the enemy group, that the rage is, is rage about their, the enemy. And it's, it's not a sharp, um, it's not, it, it's not fundamentally separated. See, and rage is different from a momentary, like if you've had a fear when someone's coming at you and you might have an immediate physiological response, that's a feeling, but rage carries over time and it extends for beyond that momentary physiological reaction as do many other uh, negative emotions such as fear. So I don't see a sharp, it, it, it's not one comes first and the other comes second in this context. It's, it's political and it's emotional at the same, uh, at the same time. Um, thank you for, for the question. Dave, do you want to address that? Or should we go on? 
No, I, I think that was great. Um, I know we have a couple other folks with their okay. hands raised that I know we're nearing the end of our uh, our slot here. Okay. Um, uh, Naomi. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you guys both very much for this presentation. Um, definitely very interesting and complex and difficult topic, um, but important. I was particularly interested in um, what you brought forward about, I think this is something that you had brought up, Dave, about the need to let the stories out rather than being silenced, uh, kind of in the context of the criminal justice system. Um, but you had mentioned, you know, these stories may not be appropriate for, quote, like safe spaces or safe forums. I'm curious to know what kinds of forums you might have in mind or if uh, if you've kind of gone to that next step of thinking about um, what kinds of spaces may be appropriate for the hearing of the stories as you know, in conflict analysis and, and resolution, of course, it's definitely important to hear each other's stories, but while we're in this very polarized space, um, of course, we're having difficulty listening to each other. Oh. Um, yeah. Great, great question. Um, so um, are you suggesting, asking about how we should disseminate the stories of the Proud Boys, as well as other people in currently involved in political conflict? Is that your what you're asking? I think, yeah, I think that's one element. And then, like, is it a, you know, in the kind of um, very basic concept of a community forum, okay. how do you, how do you have safe spaces, nonviolent spaces for these very emotionally charged, potentially violent right. uh, conversations. Um, uh, I totally love your question and the implication about the importance of having um, open spaces where people seriously listen to us. This go your question goes beyond our immediate paper, but is obviously important. I feel that the, if this is your implication, there's absolutely a great need for people to listen sympathetically to other people on the opposing, opposing uh, stance. And it is something um, which goes back to the earlier question, what motivated some of these people, we need to hear what motivated them and so on. And I think there is um, too much resistance in academia, in certain sectors of academic research to vilify and not to uh, aggressively understand what is being said and thought and felt by extremist groups. That we need to do much more of, uh, we need to set up basically public spaces for, um, for as it were, contentious conversations. Um, and um, I, I think that that is absolutely critical. Dave, you want to add or detract from what I said? I, I would never detract from what you said. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is a great question. That's why I went to our, our discussion question number three, right? Because this is ultimately, okay, we know all these things. Now what, right? I mean, that's the big question is now what? Um, and yeah, when I said let stories breathe, I'm sort of uh, revealing, you know, uh, Dr. Sarah Cobb is my dissertation advisor and, of course, uh, a leading expert in, in narrative theory uh, and practice. So, yeah, you know, a lot of what I said about, you know, safe versus brave spaces, um, you know, a, a lot of the genesis for this was actually in a, a, a paper I wrote in one of Dan's classes, uh, at Conf 812, uh, thinking back, and uh, that was really the concluding section is, you know, can we, we have all of these things, right? Are there certain excerpts where we can start looking at those, um, you know, sort of binary categorizations where we could then, in you know, sort of an appropriate setting, if we can even get these folks in a room, right, start to generate um, complexity into these stories that are being told, right, and starting to try to, um, you know, structure and then form, you know, a, a better formed story rather than these, you know, zero and one binary good guy bad guy kind of thing. So. Um, Lots of potential here for engagement. Um, you know, I'll also say I, I wrote another article about the three percenters uh, and, um, 
And one of their chapter leaders actually emailed me, which I, I didn't know quite what to do with at the time, but he was really, I, I haven't had it yet, but he was very interested uh, in having a discussion about some of the things that raised. So I, I think there is some uh, potential for, you know, speaking uh, with folks and, you know, we just, you know, we sort of need to look at, you know, where are those where are those branches across the aisle where we can sort of, um, you know, gener again, generate that complexity and start to, um, uh, you know, ha have some better form stories than what, what's currently out there now that are, again, constantly uh, bombarded by social media and, you know, all of these other sites that are just constantly reinforcing these, these harmful um, uh, narratives. Okay. Um, pardon me, I just want to jump in and let you know that um, some people have to leave in just a few minutes and there's a request in the chat for the link to the paper again. And I think that the meeting Perfect. window is going to close in about seven minutes. Okay, thanks, Tony. Sure. Um, I can- I'll put that in there, yeah. Oh, you'll, you'll put that in, Dave? Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, so I appreciate if people have to leave. Um, uh, you're welcome to contact us and let's just put in the chat, Dave, our email address. And I think we would be very happy to um, address any question, comment, or advice that you want to give. And this is, I'm putting in mind right now. And Dave, if you want to put in yours, that would be, yeah, you did. Okay. Um, I see there was a hand, uh, Matt, is that Matthew? Um, I guess he yeah. had to. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for this great thank presentation. Very, yes. uh, the, the question that I had is more related to the international uh, impact of, of the attack on the capital. Uh, as you know, the US tends has a model of democracy for many countries around the world. And uh, this attack on the capital left some of these countries a bit puzzled. So I would like to know uh, in the light of this attack and, and of the ideology that uh, motivated it, what do you think, uh, what would you have to say about the future of democracy in America? Um, okay, again, a very important and um, difficult question. My own opinion is that, um, I agree with many others, especially some very wise historians that this represents one of the greatest threats to the American political system, um, uh, comparable to the threats during the, um, the depression, comparable to many others. And again, I think there needs to be a lot more attention to delving deeply into the underpinnings of the, uh, to in, be more inclusive, to be more sympathetic, at least to listening to the grievances of these groups. Of course, there needs to be punishment when physical, when there was criminal behavior, um, obviously on January 6th, but with that, there needs to be, I think that it's appropriate to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is um, that would address some of these issues, and it could begin with January sixth. Um, so, uh, Dave, you want to address that? Sure. No, it's, it's a wonderful question, and I, I uh, you know, upfront, I am not a political scientist. Uh, I, you know, I will say, um, for one of the facilitation uh, classes, uh, you know, when I, when I was doing my coursework, we actually explored. Uh, this question, I actually used um, uh, you know, so Proud Boy group members, you know, that people played those roles, and then some people played the roles of uh, congressional uh, leaders and staff. Um, and this was the big question, right? You know, again, we were trying to find, uh, you know, some com complexity in the stories that were being told. And really, the ultimate finding was, you know, it, is democracy even, d does it still address everything that we need? I mean, that's why you're seeing all of these other political parties right now, even though, right, they may not get elected or only have a a few percentage, you know, among Republicans and Democrats. And then again, you have these third and fourth order uh, parties. Um, so yeah, I, I think definitely a, a valid question, you know, are we in the right political system? Is it really addressing, you know, everything? Yeah, I, I think these are great questions, Dan. Okay. Um, uh, so should we, here's a question. How much time do we have? I think four minutes or so. Um, so should we 
do another st study or should we or somebody <laughs> uh, do a, a study of, uh, of another group? I mean, that's what we're kind of toying with, um, you know, using kind of the frame, the, uh, the theoretical underpinnings that we used or possibly revised, obviously, and those, you know, looking at social, there's very strong push for social movements, the theory, important work, which, by the way, I, uh, this article benefited greatly by conversations and input by Professor John Dale in sociology department. Um, so should we do more in this line? I mean, you could say no, and I would, you know, take that, of course, seriously. I would say yes, and um, I don't know how much you've been able to see any of the comments, um, but myself and um, Sam, your last name is slipping my mind at the moment, um, are both doing work in very similar areas, and uh, we'd be very interested in intersecting with your work as well. I, I think there could be some value in looking at something like the, the QAnon and their role in it because there's a very different dynamic going on there that definitely falls in many different directions as well. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? Uh, Tony? Um, uh, I would love to see more of this work and Heather and Sam, if you're interested in connecting with the Transforming the Mind for Peace Lab, these topics fit very well under the lab and there's a lot of support for you um from lab membership so please do reach out to dr rothbart um to be added to our list for Thank contact you. thanks for mentioning yeah. tony so this was yeah, one of, this was one of five projects that is um underway in the lab which is mostly student run organized and students achievements um so so let me ask a provocative question i have two minutes Should we expand the scope of future studies to include social justice movements? In other words, is there righteous rage among social justice movements? Yes. Of course, the ideology is radically different. Um, but should we, is, 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 is that, would that be considered politically um, inappropriate or morally inappropriate, given what I'm assuming is the very strong sentiments among people in this room for uh, redressing various forms of inequality and injustice. Um, I see Drav's hand. Yes, I mean, if we're going to be unbiased, then this is the only way you can be unbiased is by looking at the other side of the blade, you know, both sides, both of these movements, by present terms can be categorized as extremist. Okay. The idea of repatriation, while it has been in play for some time, you know, social justice and such, it is the first time in, I guess, a long, well, in history that marginalized groups are getting an ability to have a platform at the same time as people who formerly oppressed to them. So yes, definitely there is a point of righteous rage when, when you have a people who have been put down for centuries and they have a platform to speak, it is not unhuman to expect them to channel that rage as a form of righteousness. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Drev. Uh, Professor Kurtz. Ah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I just want to point out one thing that'd be really interesting, you know, Gandhi's idea of separating the doer from the deed. So the, he has righteous rage. Gandhi had righteous rage, but he he didn't he tried to diminish social boundaries, whereas the groups like the, the Proud Boys try to accentuate Right. social boundaries. Right. And so it might be interesting to look at some of the nuances of those differences That's in approach. Right. That's Different it. kinds of rage. What a great idea. Thank you. All right, Lester, that's our next project. Come on, let's do it. Okay, let me know. <laughs> and Dave, <laughs> that is a fantastic idea. I love that, to show that the rage is there 
I think we would say it's virtuous rage. And yet, of course, the differences are quite intense and striking. Um, and there, uh, Sam Carter has, has his hand up. Yes, yes. Um, uh, what Heather was talking about, well, I really feel like um, uh, this research is, is definitely aligned to, you know, some of the things that we've talked about before. Uh, expanding it, though, one of the things I think could be a, a good opportunity, especially when we look at like righteous rage, uh, and I'm kind of commenting on the, the previous speaker about using, you know, a nonviolent approach, or some of the historical context from other, uh, uh, other social movements, and showing some um, some similarities in comparison with that. Uh, one of the things I would offer is a little bit more more line what where I'm looking at it in some research is between radical thought and radical action. Uh, I would I would pull away the um, the false polarity between two sides because I think that in and of itself is a a, a, um, a manufactured narrative that there is only two sides in any given particular argument. Um, in a, in a state of conflict, there are multiple influencers, um, uh, endogenous and you know exogenous that are influencing that particular action. And I would say in the spectrum of social activity and social movements, there are several external factors that create that cascade effect that uh, drives um, what we consider radical action. Uh, so you know righteous rage could happen in a, um, you know, a social justice movement toward increase of um, equality in the workplace to where there is a large protest of, um, uh, of a demographic in a workforce, or it could manifest itself something as very simply as of a rise in uh, uh, um, opioid epidemics and the use of drug use for the access of, you know, illegal opiates and the movement of that. That's one of the things I'm looking at. If I can, if I can quantify those lever points there to show like, okay, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, uh, all of those have social, um, psychosocial measurable activities that can kind of trigger, um, you know, a compounding effect of radical action. Mm -hmm. um, do those same lever points also pinpoint um, uh, human trafficking? Mm. Uh, you know, something in that way. So I, I would love to push that needle a little further uh, than what we have. Over. I, I would be behind you pushing that. Um, that is a wonderful theme of the blending of radical thought with radical practice, um, which sounds to me like the kind of praxis of research, which blends both thought and action. We have gone over time um, which violates uh, one of the rules of the, the um, architects of Peace Week. I'm sorry for that. Thank you for a wonderful, um, important set of insights that you have brought to bear on this topic. We are so grateful. And again, feel free to contact Dave or me um, with any question, comment, or recommendation. Dave, you want to any final comments? No, I just wanted to thank everyone so much again. Um, and, I, and again, I, I think there were some comments about not being able to download the PDF. So if there's any issues, again, just feel free to email me uh, at my address that I put in the chat. And yes, thank you again. Okay, thank you.